one of the sort of one of the changes in the in the recent years is kind of emerging the emergence of a large group of countries where aid doesn't really matter and a group of countries where aid really matters so for a long period of development economics history most developing countries aid has been really important and i wondered has that has that framed and shaped the kind of questions and the kind of debates in development economics and if there's an ever growing group of countries where aid doesn't really matter is that going to really shape the future of development economics because it'd be different types of questions perhaps okay uh, there's, no. there's, there's, there's another very quick okay. one be, be concise just on uh, on kunal i wonder what you thought about the richard dono type work about the importance or one of the one of the things he picks up on is is uh, in east asian growth and the development state is the the importance of um, elite cohesion due to domestic insurgency or external threats so the the cohesion or the the uh, coherence amongst the elite for economic development and growth is driven by internal or external threats and i wonder how how you fit that in and what you think of that thank you okay thank you we will go here in the front pop up and then i'll go to the back afterwards uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, if I play the uh, role of the devil's advocate, the history of development economics looks like the story which is filled with the brilliant ideas, but these brilliant ideas did not have an impact on a single case of economic miracle. Development economists can take credit for the failures, uh, and we all know that. The basic ideas, the initial ideas in development economics, big push, financing gap, input substitution, they kind of led to the failure of the beginning of 1980s, the debt crisis in Latin America, the, in, in Africa. Then the ideas of the Washington Consensus led to spectacular failures in former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and also in uh, other parts of the developing world. Meanwhile, the success stories happened without any contribution of development economists. I'm a little bit exaggerating, but you know they happened by the experimentation of the strong hand politicians in East Asia. So the question is would you agree with this interpretation and I'm trying to be provocative and second can you name a single country which succeeded which uh, manufactured engineered an economic miracle which was due to some contribution of development economies because many people would say that East Africa did it despite the advisors of development economies thanks thank you very much so then we will go towards the back here Yes, now you turn left. So, a couple of quick questions. So, one of the criticisms that people like Bill Easterly and Makanda. Uh, please, please speak into the mic. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, clearly. Okay. Now I can. Great. So one of the, the criticisms that uh, people like Easterly and uh, Mkandawire have made about macro development policy, especially in African countries, is that there has been a lack of focus on individual rights and individual preferences in making macro development policy. So, you know, we, in, in the kind of the, the, as a result of you know, racism, xenophobia, uh, high discount rates of policymakers, you've had this idea of the benevolent dictator who is supposed to, you know, be a social welfare maximizer who creates policy or implements whatever policy that uh, the bank or whoever recommends. So my question is kind of going forward, is there a way to center or, or should we be trying to center kind of individual rights, individual preferences um, in, in, in kind of development policy, especially in African nations? Or is this something that you know, we kind of just push to the corner? Uh, second question is about the role of economic history and kind of also related to Kunal's presentation. Uh, and of course, African development has a history that goes beyond uh, 1950, 1960, mid-20th century. So do you think that there is a role or, or there should be more of a role of the study of, of economic history, especially in Africa, in kind of development economics? So a anyway, couple of questions there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ricardo, you indicated in the back. Be concise, please. So um, thank you so much for the food for thought of thinking how this, how our field thought changed and it has been changed and transformed. Uh, I was wondering, picking a little bit on what Andy said and the uh, um, gentleman on the, on the left, uh, my left, said also, uh, thinking about us, this institution called development community, development industry, how, how does institutional economic, economics could tell us something about how us, how we have been doing our job throughout this time, and maybe how this institution communicates with the, the institutions that you can all mentioned. Okay, thank you. Yes, please, Alain. 
sorry, uh, Alain, uh, I'll take, since the mic is in the back, let's take Mark in the back, and then we will come to Alain. And after that, I'll turn over to the panel. Thank you. So a very quick question. So I, I'm, I'm a fan of this uh, new, new work on institutions, but it seems very political economy. So it seems like, I've always thought it seems like very old economics. It seems like when I read the classical economists, they basically talk about this stuff. And it seems to me like uh, some of the economics is, uh, some of the economists of maybe this early period, seeing as it's about economic history, were kind of tone deaf to, to history. And if we, when people talk about deals, not rules, I mean, that was, feels to me that was the USA not that long ago, really. It was the UK not that long ago. It was France not that long ago. So what explains the economics profession suddenly imagining that the entire world operates like the world that they all live in? And why did they stop thinking that, that this stuff mattered? Okay, thank you. And then here in the front, Alain, and then after that, we will turn over to the panel. Three, three great presentations, but one dimension which it seems to me has been systematically missing is the role of the people. The deals have limits, the street exists, revolutions have happened, and there is indeed a limit to how much you can exercise power, and the limit to power is how much people are going to bear. And this we have to take it into account. Thank you, Alain. I will turn now over to the panel. Um, can I ask that we do it in the sequence of the presenters? So Eric first, Tony next, and Kunal last. One of the very few... And, and, sorry, and, the, and the, the sort of more concise you are, the more questions we can get. The more concise you are in your, your reactions, your replies, the more questions we can get before we stop. Do you want me to start? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, one of the very few advantages of old age is that you get to be deaf. So, uh, uh, I, and of course you can use it in a selective way, selective hearing. Uh, but I, I, I must confess that I, uh, that I really did not capture most of the questions. I did capture a few. So let me try to answer at least one that I heard, uh, and I think it was yours. Can you name any country where the development economists had any impact? Uh, I think I can name quite a few. And let me just, given, of the, ti given the time constraint, let me just mention one, uh, Indonesia. Um, I, I, I was personally involved in Indonesia, I would say from about 1870 to 2000. Now this was, the, the, this was a very difficult period, period where human rights were not respected, uh, where clearly uh, uh, you did not have a democratic form of government. But for a number of reasons, particularly the survival of the regime, it was essential for the government to try to achieve economic development. Um, and that was essentially for political reasons. They knew that the, if the poor did not benefit, if uh, the uh, uh, growth and the benefits of growth were not spread among the various regions and various islands, this would create more conflict. And they really needed the advice of development economists. Now, it so happened that uh, the Ford Foundation had uh, started a program at the University of California at Berkeley um, to train PhD, Indonesian PhDs in economics. That led to what has been called the Berkeley Mafia. At one time, there were four ministers in the cabinet who had PhDs in economics. Um, and these people were extremely influential and basically followed eclectic policies, but pro-development, pro-poor policies. So um, very respectfully, I would disagree with, I think, the assumption behind your question, which is that development e e economists did not make any contribution. And of course, I could give you many other examples. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. 
Tony? Um, I, I guess as I reflect on the questions, I, I think about the, um, the role of medicine. And economists, to my mind, um, uh, resemble nutritionists and physiotherapists and people engaged in preventative medicine. And in some ways, we're, we're here to advise countries to, on things that they should really avoid. Um, I mean, you can see that in the natural resource sector, which I've been working on. We know that um, if you have oil, gas, and mining sectors, you can get yourself into ter terrible trouble and get the revolutions that Alan referred to. Um, and, the, and the trouble is that, you know, once the patient has not taken the advice or taken it badly and is on the table, um, we're in crisis management. And we're in crisis management with, with often very kind of rusty surgical tools because we don't have enough finance, we don't have a, a proper um, trade system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and in, uh, in other ways, uh, the, the issue uh, uh, also comes down to the role of, of technical assistance in development, for which I still think there's an enormous need. And this comes to Andy's question about the role of aid. In, in countries that have plenty of funds, because they're middle-income countries or they're resource-rich, low-income countries, the, the need for good economic advice is still there. And that is the role of external economists with working with domestic economists. And I think aid you know, really needs to think and reflect on that. Aid has kind of got itself into a kind of um, a little bit of a rut where it's simply we are going to spend more and more money on basic services, either funded from tax revenues or from aid. We're going to do a randomized control trial of everything, and that will give us prosperity. Well, it might do, but countries need that advice about do not regard the international credit market as your friend. If you're a debtor, they will come after you. Do not misalign your exchange rate. Try and diversify your economy, et cetera, et cetera. So technical assistance and lessons actually from economic history because economic history, thankfully, has, is full of crises and they're excellent lessons. It's like military disasters. Military historians always look at military disasters, the most illuminating things you can see. Okay, thanks, yeah. Tony. So Kunal? Let me answer, Andy, the second question. I think Tony's answered the first of your two questions. The question of elite cohesion, what drives elites, is, is absolutely central to understanding economic development, right? And so there's no question in South Korea, the understanding of the ex external factors are very important way elites behave, they did. But think about Africa, think about Kagame and RPF. They've, you know, the, the memory of the genocide is absolutely central to the understanding that they need to keep the settlement, the settlement stable, inclusive, and also generate inclusive growth. Think about, for example, uh, you know, what happened after Museveni came to power. The understanding of what happened in the chaos before that is very central. Now, that might weaken over time as the incentives become different, but certainly I think those, those memories of what has happened in the past is also very important in explaining why elites behave in a particular way. Uh, I think that's something we need to think a bit more in economics because unless you understand elite behavior, by the way, and, and I don't know when it was published, but there was a very good book that Biden published on the role of elites in economic development, Robinson and the late Alice Amston, which I thought was one of the most interesting things I've, I've read. So, you know, we need to understand that better. So that question of what is it that brings about a stable settlement and elite cohesion is central. But there may be really different things working in different countries and not just to do with exogenous or external threats. Yeah. Um, on the question, Mark, so your question, let me just turn to your question on why have we not thought about informal institutional deals? Well, uh, and absolutely, absolutely, you're absolutely right that the US had a very much a deals-based world and for a very long time, so did many of the other Western countries. The problem in economics is we want to measure. And we want to measure, we're going to run our you know, regressions. And what can we find to measure? Formal institutions. That's one problem. I mean, that's a measurement problem. Because to measure informal institutions, for example, in our case, deals, is very tricky. How do we do that? So that's one problem. The other problem, I think, is still a, a kind of feeling that if you really somehow get this rule of law, this property rights that are codified, this you know, contracting mechanisms which are all working very well, economic growth will happen. And that still drives this kind of move to best practice institutions. That's still very much a donor. Uh, the donor still feel that's the way to do it because they don't know what else can work in many country contexts. But I think we need to kind of move away from best practice to thinking of what, I, what we call best fit 
what works in the country context needs to be thought through, which may or may not actually follow the standards kind of criteria that you tend to see in the good governance modality. So that's the tricky bit, because once you move away from formal institutions, best practice, what do we get, what else is there, is tricky. I think, but that's what we need to work on, because otherwise we won't much get much progress in terms of economic de development or anything else. So that's really important. And I think, for, for, I think it's been a challenge for donors to think through what is it that best fit might mean in different country contexts. Um, on the question of the, you know, not the non, actually in our argument, Alan, we have an argument that the problem is that growth often happens in what we call closed order deals. In other words, somebody in the, among the political elite, say Museveni in Uganda, or, uh, or uh, uh, Jerry Rawlings in Ghana offers certain deals to certain political economic actors because they want to see growth happening. Now, the close order deals often gets challenged by non elites. We saw that in India in the 2000s. The, I have a paper on this and a book where the argument I make is that the, deal, the growth was fantastic in India at that time, but it was essentially built around close order deals around chronic capitalism. And that was challenged by civil society, by the middle class, by, uh, by anti corruption agents, and so on. So the problem really is that you, at some point, at some point, if not a revolution, but some other way, the civil society, the middle class, uh, non elites can play a role in mobilizing against elites. And that often explains why we often see a situation where growth simply stops, but for very good reasons. But the growth was built around institutional foundations, which were very weak. Thank you, Kunal. Um, I'll have two more questions. Be very brief, because otherwise I will be blamed. OK. Two very quick questions. Then if you'd like to comment on the premise that what are the institutionalists like Asimov and Robinson who have been telling us that the US and the UK are the gold standards of institutions with all this power to what are they going to say now that both of those countries have demonstrated that their political institutions are inherently fragile? Okay, the lady just behind. Are you dropping out? No, okay. W one last one. Sure. Another provocative question. Is this working? It's not. No? no. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, Tony, apologize for the gender ratio of the panel. Um, can you comment on gender equality in the development economics research? I recently read in The, the Economist the number of female economists coming into the field is going down. Um, is there something more we should be doing? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that question. I could add something in the very, very end, but uh, can I ask Kunal to address the first question and then Tony and then Eric? I think, Oliver, the point really is that there's nothing that's sort of set in stone, right? I mean, the so-called, that's why I was saying that this inclusive institutions argument of Aswell Robinson is not particularly very interesting to me. Because what is inclusive and why exactly it remains inclusive is a very open question, because what we see in the UK are, it certainly goes against some of the tenets of the argument they make about inclusive institutions. So institutions themselves change. And maybe the argument is that it's all in a continuum, right? Things are changing. And even in developed countries, institutions change because for various reasons, uh, other fact, a lot of factors come to play. Uh, Trump is a good example where when we talk about rules cap capitalism, is that the case now in the US? <laughs> you know? so, uh, so I think these are important questions, which is why I think we should not start seeing things in sort of where in black and white. And we understand institutions are themselves all those all that I'm evolving for very good for very different reasons. Okay, Tony. Yeah, I think we have a real problem, as um, the speaker indicated, of um, the gender balance in economics. Um, if I could speak for for wider, because you know we could make broad statements about the need for us to all you know move towards gender equality in economics as a profession. But if I could speak for wider, uh, over the last uh, 10 years at least, we've been pushing very hard to raise the number of female economists, particularly from the developing world that are involved in our programs. And I think our current metric, is it 40%, Finn? I, I don't know what, which specific measure you're referring to, but basically half of widest research output is co-authored by women. Yeah, or single-authored. Um, so we count it in various ways. And we have those metrics. and. 
you know, we hold ourselves against that. Um, I've been at a number of conferences. The reason I've made the remark is I've been at a number of conferences where um, the balance has been completely out of line. Uh, we try and maintain the balance across the conference just for various rather dull reasons. We just have an all-male panel at this conference. Uh, if I may briefly just say to Oliver, um, uh, it's very interesting that David Cameron uh, launched a, a commission on fragility <laughs> uh, after also launching a referendum which has made Britain a fragile state. But I'll pass over that. And, and, I, I, and I will just say, uh, follow on, me on Twitter for my rants about Brexit. Okay, Eric? Um, I'm sure you're getting hungry. Uh, I, I'm getting hungry, so 30, 30 seconds. Um, I'm, I think your question is, is very well taken. Um, we are now testing whether the institutions that we believed were perhaps, if not the gold standard, the best institutions available, US, UK, whether they can withstand the ongoing storm. And, and I, the question, I mean, if you had asked me five years ago, I would have been quite optimistic. I would have said, no question. The, uh, uh, democratic institutions in place are strong enough to withstand a real storm. Today, I am much less optimistic, and this really raises the issue of uh, what is a democracy? Uh, you can have a democracy in, in form, in name, but not in reality. And I think what we see happening uh, certainly in the US, I don't want to speak about the UK, uh, is that the form of government right now is no longer democratic, or, or at least the democratic institutions, the constitution is not being followed in the way it should be followed. Um, and this raises the issue of are there really optimal institutions or are institutions something that are context specific, have to be uh, have, have to be created in the light of the initial conditions which exist in countries? And I would tend to believe that that is the case. I don't think you can come up with one model that fits all possible cases. 